Okay, I think we're at a good starting place, so I will kick us off here. Um, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. If you don't know, my name is Courtney Sammons. I am the social media and events coordinator at Grassroots Bookstore in downtown Corvallis, Oregon. And today we're very excited to have with us author Tor Hansen for his new book, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. And he's joined in conversation with biologist Carla Wise, who is also local to Corvallis. Um, Tor Hansen is a conservation biologist, a Guggenheim Fellow, and author of award-winning books, including Buzz, Feathers, The Impenetrable Forest, and The Triumph of Seeds. He lives with his son and wife on an island in Washington State. Carla Wise is a biologist turned climate solutions activist. Since 2013, she's co-led the Corvallis chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. In 2016, she published Awake on Earth, Facing Climate Change with Sanity and Grace. In 2018, she founded Power Up for Climate Solutions to provide tools and inspiration to help people act on climate change. Okay, so the way that this event is going to work is that Tora and Carla are gonna have a conversation for the majority of the event. Um, and then we're gonna save the last 10, 15 minutes for an audience Q&A. So please feel free to ask any questions that you have for Tor or Carla or both um, into the Q&A chat box in your, tool, in your toolbar right there. Um, and we'll use that to moderate the Q&A so that you can put anything fun into the regular chat, any comments or exclamations you have um, in there. And then I will also be linking um, the link to our website, Grassroots Bookstore, to be able to buy Tor's book, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, from us. And not only do we highly encourage you to buy it from our bookstore, um, but you'll be, you know, supporting Tor as an author and an indie bookstore that can bring events like this to you, which is awesome. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to let Tor and Carla take it away. <laughs> well, thank you, Courtney. That uh, was a very nice intro where, where I think we're both glad to be here. And I just want to say a special thanks to you and to Jack and Sandy and everyone at Grassroots Books for uh, inviting me and having Carla here for this discussion. I have done a number of events over the years at Grassroots, and it is just one of the one of the pillars of independent bookselling in the Pacific Northwest. So it's really nice to be back again. Uh, Carla, do you have uh, any comments before we launch in? Just, um, I'm excited to be here too. Thank you for having me as your conversation partner and thanks to Grassroots. And I loved your book. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Oh, great. Well, I appreciate that. And I'm looking forward to that discussion. And we have decided that what we'll do is maybe take the first you know, 10, 15 minutes uh, or so for me to sort of introduce that book to everyone. And then Carla and I are going to sit down and, and hash things out. And as we go, please do keep in mind that you can put your questions in that Q&A and we will save time for those at the end. And I do hope you have burning questions that must be answered this evening before you could possibly rest. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I enjoy about getting out and doing book tours when the book comes out is it gives me a chance to, you know, to quickly meet people and tell them about the book. And sometimes that's easier than other times. I, but you know, if, you're, if you've written a long book about uh, feather evolution, for example, which is something I did in the past, that takes a bit of explaining. Um, but this time around, I really think it's going to be a cinch because all I have to do is explain the title. And if I can explain the title to this book, then you will, you will get the gist of the whole story. So let's break that down. It's Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, the Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. So let's start with the, that last phrase, the biology of climate change. What am I talking about? Well, I brought a visual aid here to help in this. This is a thermometer. And I can tell you that it is precisely 70 degrees here in this office where I'm making this presentation, which is probably very close to the temperature wherever it is that you are tuning in from. And that is on purpose because we have the ability to control the climate in the places that we live. And if we set it at 70 degrees, that is right in the middle of the comfort zone for our species. So the biology of climate change asks the question, what happens when the climate 
is not controlled or is out of control because that is the situation now being faced by plants and animals everywhere. And that has all sorts of repercussions for natural systems, for species and for relationships and for all of the things that bind them together. So that is really what we talk about with the biology of climate change. And we are familiar with that now at a personal level here in the Pacific Northwest, where we have been experiencing uh, extremes in weather that are really beyond the comfort zone for our species. I don't know about all of you, but when the heat dome sat over us last summer, it certainly altered my behavior. I think it changed the behavior of everyone in this region. I was not out splitting firewood at three o'clock in the afternoon during the heat dome, and I don't think you were either. We had to adapt to those conditions, and that's precisely what is going on with species around the world. When species can change behavior, change what they do quickly in response to something, we call that in biology plasticity the ability to flex and bend, much like that old cartoon character, the comic book Plastic Man, who could stretch his body into any shape. And if you think about it from the human standpoint, you can understand plasticity by considering the recent Olympics or Paralympics in Tokyo, where elite athletes from around the world descended upon that city uh, to compete. And many of them did so literally. They descended literally because they had been training at high altitudes. And athletes train at high altitudes because the air is less dense and every breath they take has fewer molecules of oxygen. And when you train at that altitude, your body compensates by producing more red blood cells and altering blood flow and breathing patterns so that you can train normally. You don't have to think about that. You don't have to write it on your to-do list. That is an example of plasticity. That response is baked in to our genetic code. All of us can do it. We might not all be Olympic athletes, but all of us can adapt to high altitudes unconsciously. It's built in. And if there were an Olympics of plasticity, the gold medal might have to go to a creature called the Humboldt squid, also known as the jumbo squid. This has, uh, is a species with a huge range in the Pacific Ocean, but in the Gulf of Mexico, or Gulf of California, I should say, uh, sort of south of the Sea of Cortez, there's a traditional fishery. And the people there, after a series of marine heat waves over the past 10 years or so, were no longer catching these squid. They couldn't catch them anywhere. And they figured that, like so many species around the world, the squid had moved changed their location, looking for cooler waters that were more comfortable for them. Because species everywhere are on the move, adjusting their home ranges in response to a change in climate. Because they couldn't catch the squid, squid are gone, forget it. Until some biologists went down to look for the squid, they did some surveys and they found that the squid were still there and more abundant than ever. Rather than responding to heat stress by departing, they had responded by changing their lifestyles completely and altering their physiology. They lived half as long, they matured in half the time, and they ate different foods. Their lifestyles were so different that under those constraints, they could only reach a fraction of their former body size. The uh, few that people were managing to hook they were throwing back as juveniles or another species altogether. The hooks that they had been using to catch the squid in the past were too big to catch the new form of the Humboldt squid, a metal winner in terms of plasticity. And when we look now at how plants and animals are responding to climate change, and it's happening everywhere, the stories are often some version of that squid story. They are responding in ways that are already baked in to their genetic code. They have some flexibility and we wish that all species had a lot of it because it allows a rapid response. But now there are even some tantalizing examples of not just a plastic response, but an actual evolutionary response to climate change. Something that people can measure in real time. And one of the great examples of this 
comes to us from the Turks and Caicos Islands in the Caribbean. It's a story of a lizard called an anole, which is a distant relative to the iguana, small thing. And it comes to us from a researcher named Colin Donahue, who is a herpetologist who was down there studying these anoles in the Turks and Caicos. And he had measured a population very thoroughly because he was interested in the impacts of non-native rats upon those lizards. The idea was you measure all the lizards, you take the, the rats away, you eliminate the rats, and then you watch the lizard population rebound in their absence. So he had done the first part and then a hurricane struck, or as he pointed out to me, uh, two hurricanes. And we're going to pick up his story uh, right out of the book, a short reading to share with you. Uh, and then we'll turn it over to our conversation. So this begins with a quotation from another book, a wonderful book called The Leopard by Giuseppe Lampedusa, where he wrote, if we want things to stay as they are, things will have to change. Actually, it was two hurricanes, Donahue clarified, when I called him to ask how the story played out. Hurricane Irma struck first, pummeling the Eastern Caribbean with torrential rains, storm surge, and category five winds exceeding 175 miles per hour. Just two weeks later, Hurricane Maria swept through with similar force. The combined storms devastated low-lying islands like the ones where Donahue's lizards lived, uprooting trees, flattening structures, and leaving both natural and human communities reeling. Needless to say, researchers put the rat project on an indefinite hold, but for Donahue, that setback also offered an opportunity. While his questions about lizards and rats would have to wait, he was now in the perfect position to study the effects of hurricanes. Had any lizards survived? And if so, was the sur surviving population measurably different from the one he had just studied? We had no idea what to expect, he told me, but I knew we weren't going to get another chance at that kind of data. So he cobbled together some funding, headed back to the Caribbean and found himself in a sort of scientific deja vu, repeating the exact same field project he'd just completed six weeks earlier. We were on a short timeline, so it was pretty much catching and measuring lizards all day long, Donahue recalled, but he described that trip with obvious pleasure as if this were precisely how anyone would want to spend their time on a tropical island. In conversation, Donahue's enthusiasm for science borders on exuberance. He comes across as someone who probably keeps working and thinking long after other people might quit for the day and retire to the poolside bar. That may be why he recognized the potential value of returning so soon to resurvey his lizards, and it's almost certainly why it occurred to him to bring along a leaf blower. The customs officer was very confused, he said, and laughed out loud at the memory of trying to explain the science behind traveling with a large piece of landscaping equipment. We needed to know how the lizards behaved in hurricane force wind, he told me. It was possible they might run for it or hunker down in the roots. We didn't know. Since watching lizards in a real hurricane was out of the question, Donahue used the leaf blower to simulate one inside his hotel room. And I have to say, I have always wondered what the people in the next room thought about that. I mean, it's one thing if someone turns the TV on kind of loud, but a leaf blower. At any rate, Colin conducted this experiment and what he saw perfectly explained the pattern that he had seen in his data. What he saw was this. When he turned on the leaf blower and he had a lizard on a stick, the lizard would go to the lee side of the stick and hold on tight. And as he increased the speed of the wind, the back legs of the lizard would start to slip off the stick until finally the legs would slip free entirely and the whole body of the lizard would be flapping like a flag in the wind while it held on tight with its front legs. This explained Colin's data because he had found that in fact, the survivors were measurably different. The ones that had survived that hurricane or those two hurricanes uh, had measurably larger toe pads for holding on tight 
in the wind. They had measurably larger, stronger front legs for gripping the stick. And, and this had been a bit of a mystery before the experiment, they had short back legs. But the short back legs reduced drag on their bodies when they were flapping, letting those lizards hang on for just a few seconds longer, which in the middle of a hurricane can be all it takes to survive. So Colin realized in that moment that he had just measured survival of the fittest in action. Natural selection playing out not over hundreds or thousands of years, but over the course of a single field season. So the study of the biology of climate change is full of those kinds of surprises, those kinds of aha moments for scientists and true surprises. Those stories, I believe, make it fascinating, but it is also a fraught field of study because not all species are so adaptable. Not all species can respond like a squid or a lizard. We know that again from our own experience here in the, in the Northwest when blue mussels during the heat dome exposed to temperatures of 120 degrees at low tide died by the hundreds of millions on our beaches. Mm -hmm. And we know by the Bramble Key Malomies, a mouse-like creature recently confirmed as the first mammal species lost to climate change when all of its habitat in Australia was inundated by sea level rise. So studying the biology of climate change does not make scientists worry less about this crisis, but it can help them to worry smart. It can help them to worry smart by allocating scarce resources in terms of research and conservation effort and policy effort to the species and systems that need our help the most. And I believe it helps us as well at a personal level as we try to allocate our scarce emotional capital to this crisis. We need to know what to worry about too. And we can learn from and also take inspiration from the creatures that we study in nature. Because if a tiny lizard can evolve in response to this crisis, then it stands to reason we can alter some of the behaviors that are bringing it about. So with that mouthful, I want to invite Carla to pepper me with questions that she's <laughs> prepared in advance and, and we will have a conversation and prelude to the Q&A. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I, I do have questions, but as I was listening to you tell the story of the lizard, the hurricane lizards, I just um, was kind of thinking about how amazing Charles Darwin would have found that story because, you know, if you've read his work, you realize that he sort of puzzled this out of how evolution actually works without ever being able to watch it in action. And now we have these examples where it's literally playing out in times and with biologists watching who can, who can measure it. And just what, a, what an amazing sort of example of the theory of natural selection being um, sort of illustrated in a perfect way. <laughs> I agree. And I think that Darwin would have been astounded yeah. in that from his perspective, evolution was a slow process right. of incremental change. In yeah. fact, he was challenged by the idea of the apparently rapid evolution of flowering plants in the fossil record, right. which he could see he studied fossils as well as live creatures. And it was well known at that time that there were no flowering plants, no flowering plants and all these layers. And then yeah. suddenly in the rocks, they were full of fossils and they were everywhere. And it, it, it was what he called, I, I believe the, the one of the greatest challenges to his idea. Yeah. How did these, these, these uh, complex, flowering plants appear and, and appear so prolifically. And he decided in the end that they must have evolved slowly and incrementally somewhere else and then dispersed quickly to the places where they were fossilized. That was the way he tried to explain that. And it was much later after he died that people realized that in fact, that evolutionary leap had been very rapid in part because of the way that flowering plants interact with insects and so forth. It's a cool story, but that's probably uh, too much information. Uh, so I believe you are correct that he would be not only fascinated by, but astounded to see how rapidly 
that evolution can be measured. Yeah, I want to I want to talk to you a little bit about about the speed of these processes. Um, I I was uh, really taken with the section in your book where you talk about uh, let's see, Savante Arrhenius, who predicted I I'm probably saying that wrong who predicted um, back in, I think you, in 1896, that, um, that the burning of fossil fuels was going to result in um, a doubling of CO2. And he predicted, interestingly, that it would happen in 3,000 years, according to your research, and that it would be a good thing, right? Which, incidentally, he's not the only person to have sort of Mis, uh, misunderstood what climate change would be for humans. But um, I, so I wanted to sort of bring up the question of the speed of the changes that we're bringing about and what that means for organisms. Um, because really, you know, the question I sort of have is if this were going on in three thousand, and it was three thousand years instead of one hundred and fifty, when we doubled the CO two, um, what are your thoughts about sort of biologically what that would what that would mean for other species, um, and and whether whether the speed with which we're doing this um, um, is is really going to allow the adaptation and the evolution for most of the organisms on earth or is it just too fast yeah this is a wonderful a wonderful question and arrhenius of course was a swede and in snowy sweden the idea of a warmer planet sounded pretty good uh, in fact uh, you know one of the concerns in science at that time particularly in, in the northern countries was what would happen if there was a return of the ice age they had started to figure out that all of this stuff was was covered with ice at one time and so this idea that hey things are getting warmer that was greeted with uh, with real gusto at the time people thought that was super uh, and you're right that it's happening faster than he predicted and happening faster really than most of the rapid change events we've seen in the past. You know, change, of course, is constant in nature. And, you know, the, the whole world, the word evolve, you know, is, is this idea of change, this, you know, evolving, rolling uh, process that goes on all the time. So what we're seeing now that's different is not so much that things are changing, it's the, it's the pace, it's the speed of it, as you pointed out. And, if we can slow it down, that's one of the reasons that so much emphasis is, is being put on trying to slow this process because we don't just buy ourselves time to adjust, we buy all these species time. And the more time they have to adjust, the more opportunity there is to make those adjustments. You know, the example of the hurricane lizards is fascinating and wonderful, but most species aren't going to be able to make evolutionary leaps in time to keep up with all the changes in their environment. Because what we're learning is that it's not just the temperature and the weather that's changing. When you start to make these changes, you start to influence the timing of events in nature. When things happen, that starts to uh, affect relationships. You start to affect where creatures are, you know, that we, everyone assumed those squid had simply left the warm Gulf of California uh, because so many creatures are moving. Between 25 and 85 percent of the species on the planet are adjusting their ranges to try to find their comfort zone again somewhere in this rapidly changing landscape. And when you start moving things around and changing the timing of things, what you're really doing is creating novel or brand new ecosystems, putting species together that have not interacted so much uh, in the past. And that kind of change is just as challenging or presents just this, you know, a whole new suite of challenges to plants and animals in addition to just a tweak in the weather. So we're seeing a huge number of challenges created. And for many species, it, there will not be time on the current trajectory to adjust 
uh, rapidly enough, to evolve rapidly enough, or even to move rapidly enough to get to a place where they can, where they can survive. We see that with a num number of species whose dispersal capability is there, but perhaps not fast enough to get to the parts of the continent or the ocean that are becoming more suitable for them. So it's a whole suite of problems, but the speed of it is what makes it in some ways extremely challenging for plants and animals to adapt. And particularly we worry about the slow pokes and the specialists, if you specialists, will. Specialists, right. You know, if there are creatures that are dependent upon a particular habitat or dependent upon a, a particular relationship with another creature that may be changing in a different, or, or changing its behavior and so forth in a different way, those fragile relationships are truly at risk now. So the slow pokes and the specialists are some of the species that we worry about the most. Yeah. One thing that I found really impressive about your book was the way that you were able to find um, sort of illustrations of, of so many different implications for organisms of, of the changing climate that both sort of immediate implications like my client, my, my habitat's too hot. Um, and all kinds of cascading effects that you wouldn't think about immediately, you know, mismatches in timing with pollinators and, um, you know, growth of fungi because it's warmer that then causes disease. And, you know, there's just so many crazy things that are going on out there that luckily there's biologists all over the world that are studying these things. Um, and I guess I wanted to ask you how you how you discovered all of these um, different people doing all this work? How did you choose your cases? Because I feel like you did a great job of sort of the showing the entire, not only globally, but also sort of biologically, all of the implications of the changing climate. Well, if, as you can imagine, this is a popular field of study right now in biology. And so getting my head into and around that deluge of information was, you know, drinking from the proverbial fire hose. But I did have a set of criteria for the sorts of examples that I wanted to use. And that did help narrow things down. I, I really wanted to find examples of things that people were able to see and measure so that it was very concrete and, and, and not things where we had an indication of what might happen and then we built models to predict. That's very common too and very important because we have to plan ahead. But I, I really wanted to go that extra step to find the, the researchers who had seen this stuff in action on the ground and measured it and figured it out in that way. So we really had a concrete example that we could relate to in, and look for, a diversity of creatures and plants that were experiencing these things. And so I used those to sort of guide me to the studies that stood out. And then I would simply reach out to the scientists involved and almost invariably, they were happy to talk about their work and to share with me the stories of how you know, these projects came together and, and how they had their aha moments. And because that is something that is so common now in biology is, and really one of the, the most common themes in the book from the standpoint of the scientists is how they went to the field expecting to study one thing. Right. And when they got there, they found that the conditions on the ground were so different, not just in terms of climate and, and temperature, but in terms of the lifestyles of the organisms they'd gone to study, that they came away having studied something totally different. And those were the stories I really looked for because I think it's an example from the scientific perspective of how rapidly this is happening and what capacity there is for adaptation out there that you can see you know, over the course of a field season or two or three or whatever the length of study was. Mm -hmm. So those were the cases, the case studies that I really looked for. And you know, it continues, you know, I see more stuff coming out all the time that I wish I had a way to shoehorn into the book. There's, there are a lot of wonderful studies going on right now that will be very helpful for us in trying to navigate this whole crisis. Yeah. Do you want to talk at all about Walden? <laughs> I, I, 
I love, I love that the, anyway, do you want to, do you want to tell people about that? I, I just think that's very cool. Isn't, isn't that marvelous? Yeah, I was immediately attracted to this story uh, because it sort of combines, you know, science and literature and nature writing and all, right. so all sorts of things that I am, you know, very passionate about. And, and it really boils down to the power of observation and the power of not paying attention and yeah. paying careful attention to your surroundings. If you go out into your yard or the near, nearest park or wherever you happen to live and start paying attention now, you're going to see change happening uh, in response to the climate uh, crisis because plants and animals at the local level are doing different things. You can see it just in terms of when things bloom or when you hear the first bird or seabirds nesting or whatever is happening in your yard, you'll see those changes. And if you write your observations down the way that Henry David Thoreau did in the mid 19th century, then those observations may become very valuable. Because not only was he a, a good writer and a, and a good uh, philosophizer and, and you know, just a good thinker in general, as he sat there in his cabin at Walden Pond, he was also a meticulous record keeper. And he would go out on his daily rambles, not just to think and see things, but to see what was happening and write it down. And he had these, these journal entries, he made these notebooks that looked like the precursor to a modern spreadsheet with the species <laughs> down the side and lists of observations under different headings going this way and that. Uh, and he noted when leaves came out on plants in the spring. And he noted when the first flowers bloomed of all these different species. He noted when he heard the first bird songs of various species, when he saw things, you know, doing nesting behavior and all that sort of stuff in the spring, in the summer, in the fall, he just kept these notes constantly. And then they were completely lost. Uh, they, were, they were buried in museum collections one in New York, one, I believe, at Harvard. And the scientists didn't know about it. I mean, everyone knows about Thoreau, uh, but nobody knew he had all this data. And it was a chance occurrence when a botanist named Richard Premack, wonderful botanist at Boston University, mm -hmm. started doing studies at Walden because he was interested in the effects of climate change on what we call in, in the business phenology, the timing of events in nature. And he thought this will be a good place to study because it's pretty close to campus. It's still you know, relatively pristine for something not far from an urban center. And you know, since it's so famous, there have been naturalists there making bird lists and looking for plants you know, ever since Thoreau. I mean, it's, it's a famous place. And so he got started on that. And he was well into it before a casual conversation with a Thoreau scholar uh, led to these data sets. Well, just to the plant data set. The first guy said, well, oh, you're doing plants at Walden. Yeah, you must be really interested in that stuff that Thoreau wrote down about when they all bloomed and everything. <laughs> and Premax said, what? You never <laughs> heard of it. And so this guy turned, who was a Thoreau scholar and knew all of these unpublished things were in various collections here and there. He led him to that data and it was, it was a gold mine, an absolute gold mine because now you had a baseline from the mid 19th century, from the beginning really uh, of the impacts of all of this fossil fuel burning and industrialization and so forth, uh, from which you could make comparisons with the modern data. And so then Premack was able to say that indeed, you know, these uh, sorrels and other wildflowers that Thoreau was noting blooming in April and May were blooming weeks, in some cases, even months earlier. And the, 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 the lovely yellow smell of willows that Thoreau described at certain times were weeks earlier in the spring. He had the data to show how fast those things were changing and then start extrapolating from there into all the implications that has for pollinator relationships, for competition among plants, for competition between wildflowers and trees and on and on and on. And Premack told me that if he and others now were to list Thoreau as a co-author on their studies, which they consider doing in some cases, if they were to do that, that Henry David Thoreau would be one of the most prolific climate change scientists of the 21st century. Isn't that amazing? It's fantastic. So I, I, yeah, I love that. 
Another favorite part of your book for me, I mean, I love that Thoreau stuff, but also another favorite that I wanted to talk to you about was um, the chapter about surprises. You have a chapter in the book that's just, I think it's just titled Surprise, Surprise, Surprise or something like that. And um, I think what I like so much about this chapter is uh, just how often working as a biologist, but also as a climate advocate, how often we're humbled by thinking that we know what's going to happen and then it doesn't happen that way. And, um, you know, I, I, I honestly think that maybe there's something about the pandemic where maybe it really did sink in that we never know what's going to happen. <laughs> but because <laughs> um, who expected a global pandemic? But I think that the, the, the chapter about surprises to me was incredibly powerful and moving because um, there, you know, we do have a lot of predictions about the, what's going to happen to different species, about the impacts on generalists and specialists and moving, you know, away from the equators and, you know, different things that upslope to get into cooler habitats. And those things are valid predictions. But I love the fact that you were able to go out and find these incredibly surprising examples where, you know, the prediction is just completely turned on its head because of something that we couldn't see and couldn't foresee um, where an organism does something unexpected um, or, you know, in the case of the, um, the, I guess, do you pronounce it dove keys? Yes. In yes. the case of the dove keys, which just do something completely unexpected that the scientists are not expected. And also, I love that Joshua tree story as well. Um, so I just, I wanted to talk to you about those because I, I think that, that um, as much as predictions are useful, I think it's also um, fascinating and humbling and sort of good to remember that we often have no idea how things yeah. will turn out. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I mean, that is another theme, expect the unexpected, right? Because we can't predict everything that's going, ha going to happen. The, these systems are so complex and the changes we have set in motion are very hard to predict. Some general rules apply, you bet, but there are surprises out there. And David Gremelet, a French scientist who uh, uh, told me the dove key story, he said, you know, even if you think you know, you have to get out into the field and see what, what creatures are doing because very often they surprise you. And I think that example is fabulous. It, this story comes to us from the Franz Josef Land archipelago in the Arctic in Russia. And I think we're familiar with the idea of Arctic sea ice and climate change because of that iconic image of the polar bear stranded on a, on a shrinking iceberg. But if you could look beyond the bear to the edge of the ice, you might see this delightful little seabird, the little auk or dovekey which makes its living or has made its living along the edge of those Arctic ice flows where there are particularly dense populations of the zooplankton that the dovekeys feed upon. Great strategy until the ice began to re retreat farther and farther every summer from the islands in the Arctic where the dovekeys breed. And you can imagine that that flight distance then for a dovekey to go from its nest to get food to bring back to its chicks would get longer and longer until finally the population would collapse. They couldn't possibly sustain that. So dovekeys have long been held up as uh, an early casualty or predicted to be an early casualty uh, due to climate change. Until Gremelet and others went on an expedition to Franz Josef Land and they found something different. They attached little tags to the dove keys, of course, and set them uh, back to their nesting colony. And when they finally got that first batch of data back from the dove keys, they had made all these predictions that they calculated the distance to the ice flow and it was going to take the dove keys at least an hour to fly, at top speed to fly there. Uh, and so they downloaded and, and to see how long they'd been in the air, less than four minutes. It, you know, and Gremlin described that scene to me. They were in this, you know, freezing, cold, uh, Arctic 
research center that had been sort of in disrepair and they're surrounded by all their Russian colleagues and they're looking at their laptops, my God. And they had this incredible discussion about what could possibly be happening here. And I, I imagine that there might've been a sip or two of vodka lubricating that brainstorming session. And they came out of it with a totally new theory. Obviously the Dove Keys had pivoted to a new feeding source. Mm. And what Gremelet and his colleagues re re realized and recognized was that because the island's glaciers were melting, there was this zone at the edge of the fjord where the research station was located and where the dove keys were on shore breeding and, and nesting where this milky blue glacial meltwater was slamming into the dark cold currents of the Arctic Ocean. And Gremelet told me that you know, he had trained and some of his colleagues, they had trained as oceanographers even before they started studying birds. So they knew what that transition meant for little creatures like zooplankton, swimming from one kind of water that is so different into another is like swimming into a brick wall, you know, full speed. And they were stunned or even dead, killed by that transition. And it created this curtain of plankton at the mouth of the fjord, the dovekeys had found it and they were feeding there and not only surviving, they were thriving on that new food source. And the, the, the success of their chicks was precisely the same as it had been when the Arctic ice flows were closed. So with that one realization, the whole story of dovekeys and climate change altered from one of despair into one of hope and resilience because the glaciers there will be providing that food source for them for at least a century, maybe as long as 180 years. So it's a great way for the Dove Keys then to buy time to find other ways to adjust to what is a rapidly changing Arctic environment. Love it. <laughs> and the other story in that chapter that I wanted to ask you about was, well, I think I love this story for a different reason, not not just because it's about unexpected results, but it's also about a biologist's absolute extraordinary ingenuity in the face of having zero funding. Yeah. To, <laughs> and then getting this amazing scientific result. And um, that's the story of um, the, the Joshua tree research. Joshua trees are declining because of climate change. But, um, but there was a scientist down there who wanted to look into why that was happening, but he couldn't get funded. And yeah. uh, he found some ingenious ways around that. So do you want to tell that story? It's, I love that you, you picked up on that because I- it's Oh, that's my reasons. favorite. <laughs> I loved it too, because funding is so limited in science. And sometimes you have a great idea, but you can't make it happen. Yeah. Ken Cole is this fellow's name, and he was sitting on- you know, a great data set for Joshua trees because he studies the, the uh, dung middens of pack rats. And pack rat urine, you know, it's a factoid for your evening, uh, it solidifies into something much like amber and preserves everything within it. So when a pack rat makes a midden, they're gathering plant material from all around the vicinity of their nest. And if they pee on it enough, it turns into this solid mass that lasts for thousands of years. And if you take that apart, uh, hold your nose a little bit and get the bits out of there, you know what the plant community was like. And you know, Cole had this data and he knew that Joshua trees had been moving up, back and forth in the landscape in response to other changes in temperature and so forth in the past. And they, they weren't moving now and he wanted to know why. And he had an idea of why, because uh, as a graduate student, he had been on a field trip to a cave in the Grand Canyon where they were standing not on a pack rat mitten, but on a huge pile of fossilized uh, giant ground sloth dung, the Shasta giant ground sloth. And he knew for his memory of that trip was that that dung was full of Joshua tree uh, remains from the seeds and the fruits and so forth. 
And so he had this idea in mind that the, the, the ground sloth could be the reason that Joshua trees seem to be failing to move now because the ground sloths had gone extinct when it's assumed that people hunted the last one to extinction about 14,000 years ago. But he had such limited funny, he couldn't get this idea off the ground and he needed all sorts of things. To make it solid, he needed to know, you know where Joshua trees were now. And you would think that would be obvious, but there wasn't a good map out there. He had the historical data, which actually you would think would be much harder to get. He had that in spades, but he didn't have a map of where they were now. He had no funding to hire a team. So he came up with a novel way to do it. He looked online at real estate ads. Every time a piece of property came up for sale in the real estate ads for the Mojave Desert, uh, you, they would always have, you know, a few pictures of the house and the view and what, you know, the, the environment there. And Joshua trees are such distinctive uh, plants. They're these massive yuccas with, you know, bent uh, limbs and so forth, you know, famous from the album of uh, the same name by the rock band U2, that he would just look at these pictures and he could map. He had then uh, geolocated data for Joshua trees across their range. And so that was the, the missing piece of data he needed to, to sort of put this story together. And they never did get it funded, but he and a colleague who did some other work uh, put their pieces together without funding, published it, and it was a fantastic uh, success scientifically because they were able to tell the story of what's missing. And what I love about it too is that it reminds us that climate change is not the only challenge that plants and animals are facing. You know, we have created other challenges for them in their environment by reducing their habitat, by removing, in this case, a critical long distance disperser. Not just in the last, you know, 100 or 200 years, 14,000 years ago, and we are still feeling the reper repercussions of those changes today. So I think his story also underscores, you know, the complexity of the situation now, because it's not just climate change and all of those challenges. That's on top of mm -hmm. the challenges we've already created for them. Yeah. In fact, and I'll stop here, but I, I like this factoid too. There's a marvelous book called The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert from mm -hmm. several years ago about how, you know, human activities are creating this mass extinction event uh, and, you know, much of that driven or some of it driven by climate uh, change. Uh, but what's fascinating to me is that there was a, another book by Richard Leakey, a Kenyan conservation biologist in the early 1990s called The Sixth Extinction. And if you read that book, the phrase climate change does not appear within it. So at that time, Leakey and others were already considering the fact that we were within a sixth extinction event before the repercussions of climate change had become clear. So we, we have already created a great challenge for plants and animals. Now we are multiplying that threat. Yeah. It was interesting that you used the term threat multiplier to describe climate change because, you know, in my work in climate, I'm used to seeing that term used by military experts and various kinds of folks who are talking about sort of human, the implications on humans that, that climate change is the ultimate threat multiplier, but you used it in a, also in a biological, um, which I thought was very, apt in a situation like with the Joshua trees where they've lost their primary um, dispersal agent that would allow them to move the hundreds of miles or however far it was that they used to be able to move in response to climate. We've maybe taken out their dispersal agent and then climate change comes along and maybe it's the final nail in the coffin. Um, but I, I had never seen it used that way. I thought that was interesting. I came across that term, but as you say, it was in a military planning document. Yeah. This is, you know, from I think 2006. And it really caught my attention because, as you say, it's, it's useful in a human context. If you talk about, you know, social political challenges, which is what the military is often focused on, they see climate change as something that multiplies those threats. If they're 
is a, a, a society challenged by food shortages, well, it's going to get worse because climate change multiplies the threat. And I thought, you know, we see the same thing in a lot of biological situations. If there are existing threats to plants and animals, you add climate change and it makes those threats greater. A classic example, again, from here in the Pacific Northwest, would be the disappearance or vast reduction of starfish off our coastlines. The, the classic Pisaster sea stars, but also the big sun stars, the really big ones, which are almost completely gone now from this part of their range. And it is a situation where that decline has been blamed on some sort of disease, but one of the classic studies of it where they really realized what was going on or the role that climate might be playing had to do with a bunch of starfish in a tank. And they were trying to figure out this disease question, if it's a virus or bacteria, what's going on? And they had these healthy starfish in this tank because you got to have some healthy ones if you're going to understand you know, what makes starfish sick. And then the fellows who came around, the maintenance crew uh, cleaning the tanks, forgot and they left the, uh, the water flow on in the starfish tank. And part of it was in the sun. And so the temperature shot up. And you know, soon people realized, oh, no, no, the starfish. And they turned them back on. And they looked in, and the starfish were fine, and so on. And OK, it was just a, you know, a heat spike, but they're OK. And then they came in a day or two days later, and all those starfish were dying from the disease. They had had it in their systems, but it was the threat multiplier of heat stress that made it express itself and, and, and it caused it to you know, literally disintegrate their bodies. Mm -hmm. So I think there are many examples of that in nature where climate change multiplies existing threats in the environment. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Courtney. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Um, thank you both. Wow. I've learned so mm -hmm. much. Um, and I definitely, you know, want to read both of your books again. Um, I, we have two great questions that I thought we'd, you know, answer in the amount of time left. The first one is from Leah and they say, thank you both for this wonderful conversation. I'm learning so much. This is half comment, half question. It seems to me that your way of approaching climate change from a biological lens could make telling about the crisis and adaption much more tangible, fascinating, and engaging for children and youth. What do you think about the way we teach about climate change in schools and what changes would you make? I think it's for both of you. Great question. Carla, do you wanna go first? Oh, or I can't. Or either go, way, go ahead, ahead Tor. I oh, yeah, I'm yeah, very no, ambivalent I, about the answer to this question. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think that I mean I can't answer it broadly because I I you know I I haven't taught this you know in school yet for kids, but what I I feel very strongly is that curiosity is a powerful tool for investigating this crisis in that oftentimes we can uh, feel beaten down by the scale of it and the result is despair. But despair is, is not useful. Despair leads to despair, whereas curiosity leads to learning and is much more likely to lead to action. So I do think that, that the biology, these stories of what's happening in nature are a very useful tool for getting anyone, including children, uh, and there's actually the possibility maybe of, of some of these stories being turned into books for kids, which I'm really excited about, uh, because I think that's a really useful way to talk about this crisis so that we uh, learn about it. Because, I mean, if you fundamentally, it's really hard to solve a problem if you aren't even interested in it. Uh, and so I think these stories that make us interested in climate change, that make us think about it in different ways, not just biology, there are different ways to tell these stories. I think those stories and the power of storytelling and the curiosity it creates within us is a really way for us to teach and to learn at any age. I completely agree. And I, I think, I think I said I was ambivalent and I think what my, my difficulty here is you know, I do a lot of climate advocacy, and um, and and I I think that I've I've started to feel really uh, torn about youth, about children, about you know I I've I've encountered 
some young people who are sort of angry at everybody who's older than they are for not having done more. <laughs> and I, I can't really blame them in one way. Um, and, and, you know, so I think that it's hard for me. It's just a hard question to answer because I really, I want children to be able to be children and I don't want them to feel despair, but, you know, this is the situation in our world and the, and the biological responses are fascinating. And it certainly is something where I'd like our schools to be teaching children about the reality and the science and everything about our world right now. I just want to do it in a way that, again, that that is allows them to still be children and uh, and and it's hard. That's a hard thing to find, I think. For so that's. But thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the next question is from Sandy, and she asks. Uh, speaking of surprises, the heat dome and the browning of our beautiful conifer forest in the coast range heading home from Newport, Oregon, this summer was shocking to see. Was this widespread throughout the Northwest and has it been measured? Are there any ideas as to what we might expect to see happening from that uh, browning? Good question. I don't have current data on all of it, but what I know from the, uh, the last review of impacts on conifers that I read for the Pacific Northwest is that what's really stressing out these trees is the long drought periods in the summertime. In many places, uh, we're, our overall rainfall is not changing on an annual basis, but it's becoming uh, concentrated, as we have experienced in the past few days here on San Juan Island, concentrated in, in big bursts. And you end up with these long stretches of drought. Uh, even if it doesn't qualify as a drought year, you get all your rainfall, but you have this big gap now running. In, in our case, it was from July all the way through most of September. Uh, and that's a long time to go without a drink of water for many of these conifers. And so we see browning in our neck of the woods regularly in certain species, western red cedar. Uh, we see it in grand fir. Dug fir are a little more plastic, if you will, a little more adaptable. But some of these species are definitely suffering. And the long-term predictions, again, are for range shifts in many cases. And the question then becomes, can the trees move shift their ranges fast enough to reach places that may be coming more habitable for them uh, to the north or you know, in other pockets and places where they can survive. But it's certainly predicted to have a, you know, a dramatic, in some places, impact on the species composition of the forest. And I don't, I just want to add, I don't know if the, the question was also about whether the heat dome itself was within the predictions um or not but but i do think that this is an example of um you know sort of surprises and expecting the unexpected and you know i i happen to know because i've been thinking about climate change for a long time that you know the predictions have been that we live in a in a relatively in a refugia really in the pacific northwest and um there there wasn't really anybody predicting that we were going to have heat domes or fires on the west side of the, you know, cascades, but that's what we're seeing now. So I think, you know, our predictions are not, they're, they're really very um, limited in our ability to sort of specifically see what's coming around the corner, um, which I think just says we need to expect the unexpected. <laughs> Yeah, surprise, surprise, indeed. Yeah. And there's something about that biologically or from an evolutionary standpoint that I find really interesting too. Mm -hmm. When you look at something like the heat dome effect for some creatures in this environment, that is an experience that isn't just outside of normal and just isn't just outside of you know recent history. There are species who have never experienced those temperatures uh, or very rarely over the entire evolutionary history of the species. So when you see things that extreme, there is very little chance for some creatures 
that they will have any kind of you know, uh, plasticity for that kind of event because they haven't experienced it before. And so that's a really interesting question. If those sorts of things become common as now it may you know, turn out to be the case, uh, that is a stress beyond even the evolutionary history of a lot of species out there. And, and that is fascinating, but you know, very dire and fraught. All right, and with that, it brings us to eight o'clock. Um, so we are ready to sign off, but I just wanna remind everyone who's watching, first of all, thank you Tor and Carla for being here. This has been an amazing conversation. I'm so happy to I have been a part of it. Um, thank you for having us, it was really fun. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed talking to Tor and, and, and his book was really spectacular. Yeah, we're so happy to have you here with us, Carla. Um, and I want to remind everyone in the audience, first of all, thank you for being here as well. We can't have exciting events like this without you guys here watching. Um, and the links, again, I did put them in the bio, but you can always go to our website um, to purchase Tor's book, Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. We also have in stock at store Carla's book, um, Awake on Earth. So you can get e both of those and either of them and you can read them and gift them. Um, and you know, read their books and get them and support grassroots. So with that, I'm gonna sign off for the night. Thank you again both and have a lovely evening. Thanks to Thank everyone, you. it was really fun. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.